Whoa! Oh. This video is sponsored by Incogni. Hey guys, Jesse here. Today, we're gonna be building another Damascus chef's knife. But today, the pattern isn't random pattern. It's actually something called Firestorm in Damascus. Firestorm Damascus sounds really complicated, but it's actually sort of just a variation of Twist Damascus. Rather than twisting straight layers, we twist something called Crush W's. This is a lot of steel. My starting billet was essentially just alternating layers of 1084 and 15 and 20. I had a little bit of extra 15 and 20 lying around, so I actually had 14 layers of 15 and 20 and only 11 layers of 1084. Sheesh. In the spirit of getting everything perfect first try, I ground off the sides of the billet again to make sure that they were flat, and I got the handle ready for welding. When I first started welding, I intuitively thought I didn't need to do anything to the rebar to weld it to the steel, but I learned from Salem Strub around two years ago that grinding some corners onto that rebar would make the welding much easier. A while ago, I mentioned that quench oil was the most accessible fluid for me to dip my billet into. This didn't make a lot of sense to a lot of people, but you have to understand that I'm the laziest bastard on this planet, and when I say most easily accessible, I mean that it's actually just sitting there in my garage. Once the billet gets up to a really nice uniform welding heat, I take it to the press and I take a really, really gentle first pass. This is actually because of a couple of very different reasons. The first of which is that I need to take this billet to the squaring dies. My squaring dies are actually really big, so I need to leave this billet as thick as possible so that I get some nice contraction on the outsides of the billet. The next reason that I took some really gentle presses on the first heat is actually normally the first most important reason. And that reason is I didn't want to tear my billet apart. There's a lot of work that goes into setting up the billet to be welded in the first place, and I didn't want to have to redo it for this one. Obviously, brushing the scale off is partially just for theatrics, but it actually tells me a lot about how the billet is welded together. If I see any harsh contrast between two separate layers of steel, then I probably know that they're not welded together. If the forge welds are truly perfect, those separate layers will come together and act like one piece of steel. I filmed this video back in December, which means that the temperatures were still pretty perfect. I didn't sweat at all up to this point, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to sweat later in the video. It might be really hard to see here, but my top dies and bottom dies aren't perfectly parallel. They're like 0 0.01 degrees off or something like that, but even still, that means I have to make sure to flip my billet every single time I take a new pass. This ensures that any bow in my billet will get self-corrected later on. If you know anything about forging hydraulic presses, you'll know that some of them have something called a digital press controller. What it does is it turns the press into sort of a robot. It allows you to input a thickness and it'll forge the piece to exactly that thickness. I've actually been thinking about getting one and attaching it to my press, but I don't know if it's considered cheating, so let me know down in the comments if you think it is, and if you think it isn't, let me know why as well. The plan now is to simply draw the billet out to a pretty long length and cut it into around 7 or 8 pieces. I want this thing to have as many crushed W's as I can. One of the things that I look for here is that I want the billet as straight as possible and I want the sides to be as parallel as possible. I don't want the dimensions from the front to be slightly different from the dimensions in the back. Obviously this is in Arizona and I'm freezing. So I sprouted a beard for a little bit more warmth. Today's video is sponsored by Incogni. Now what is Incogni? Incogni is a service that helps you scrub your personal data off the internet. And it helps ensure that your private information stays, well, private. I hate this thing. I'm taking off the beard. Ah! This is a good chance that without your knowledge, there's a copious amount of data broker websites that have your personal information, such as your credit card info, your phone number, and even your address. These data brokers then sell those juicy details to third parties. And that's when the spam calls, scam messages, and robocalls all start pouring in. What Incogni does is it figures out which brokers have your personal information, and then it sends requests to them on your behalf to have them delete your information permanently. I hear you saying in your mind, why can't I just do this myself? It turns out the average person would require 304 hours to manually send all those requests and ensure that they actually deleted your data. Incogni can do this with the push of a button, and I don't know about you, I prefer simplicity over spending 304 hours. It's time to take back your personal information with Incogni. Use code Who at the link in the description and you can get 60% off an annual plan. 
Thank you, Incogni, for sponsoring this video. And back to the forge. If you skipped to this part of the video, first of all, welcome back. Second of all, if you did watch it, I hope you enjoyed watching me freeze my ass off. It was so cold, I couldn't feel my hands for like the next half an hour. But back to the task at hand. After I cut off the dirty ends of the billet, I took it over, marked some lines, and I'm gonna be cutting it into seven separate pieces. This is like the one time I didn't use my calipers to mark the lines, and instead I just looked at the tape measure. And you'll see later on, my pieces aren't exactly the same length, but the variation that I did have is not gonna show up later in the piece. This accordion method of folding the pieces together ensures that I have a uniform pattern throughout the length of the billet. With the pieces now cut, it was time to mark them and then take them to the grinder and clean up the sides. I'm not really gonna test etch these, so the only purpose is so that they fit onto that surface grinding attachment a little bit better. Before I had my surface grinding attachment, I used to take the billet, put it in the vise, and take an angle grinder to it to get all the forge scale off. Now that I have the surface grinding attachment, I sort of just ignore that the scale is there and just go ham. The pieces come off the surface grinder incredibly hot, so I have to make sure to wear welding gloves whenever I touch them. With all the pieces now basically perfectly clean, it was time to take them over back to the vise and weld them together. Rather than doing my nice and meaty spot welds, I decided to weld the entire length of the side for each piece. In theory, this should make the billet a little bit more robust, but I don't really know for sure. Nice. Holy shit, my welds are good. <laughs> With the billet welded and the forge lit, it was time to dip it back into the quench oil and throw it back in the forge. If you're curious as to why there were so many flames coming out of the forge, it's because I had those air chokes all the way up. With the chokes all the way up, the propane can't mix with fresh air until it reaches the chamber of the forge. And since the chamber doesn't have any fresh air, it has to reach outside of the forge to actually combust. If you follow my Instagram, you'll know that at some point in the future, I want to get myself a power hammer. My dream hammer is probably a Nasal 2B or a Nasal 3B, or maybe even a Chambersburg. That's not to say I don't love my press though. The press is so compact and it can do so much work, but the thing is, it's just not that cool compared to a power hammer. The power hammer throws around a 300 pound ram and every single stroke you can feel it in your bones, like literally in your bones. It shakes you to the core. Maybe one or two years down the line when I have my own shop and I'm not working out of my parents' garage, I'll be able to pour a nice foundation and invest into an actual power hammer. Back to the task at hand, it's time to forge this billet down to an inch and a quarter square. An inch and a quarter is really thick for a twist, but that's a problem for future me to deal with. Ow. With the billet forged to final dimension, it's time to forge in the corners a little bit so that when I go to twist it and flatten it later on, I won't get a bunch of cold shuts. I knew that before I started any of the twisting, I wanted to take off this rebar handle and a bit of the garbage ends off one of the sides. The thing is, it was getting late and I didn't have time to let the billet cool and throw it in the bandsaw, so I took an angle grinder and I cut it off when the billet was still hot. But the thing is, those angle grinder discs, I don't think they're actually rated for that high of a temperature, so I actually threw some shards of that disc into my face, and it was uncomfortable, but I had no other choice. I mentioned earlier that I would be sweating at some point later in the video, and this is that point. Like, I'm a fairly strong young man, I can squat 365 pounds, deadlift over 400, but this was still one of the most difficult things I've ever done in the forge. My core was sore, my left shoulder was burning, and the steel wasn't moving at all. For some of these twists, I was putting my entire body weight into that wrench. And, okay, I don't weigh that much, I weigh like 160 pounds, but still, 160 pounds around a foot away from the rotation, that's a lot of torque, and it still didn't move that much. The thing about Firestorm Damascus is that if you twist it too little, it 
really doesn't look that cool. So I was trying to get this billet to look basically like all thread. One of the side effects of me using my super janky twisting wrench is that the billet doesn't really twist square. And so I had to take it to the press and straighten it before twisting it a little bit more. There's a lot of super satisfying things that you can see in the forge. And I think this is probably in the top five. Watching that scale fall off those super tightly twisted ridges is just so awesome. With all my twists into the billet, it's time to start forging it slightly square and get ready to actually forge the blade. Let me get my vermiculite. Oh, is that as deep as it goes? To start forging the blade, the first thing that I do is I actually cut off both of the dirty ends of the billet. The only reason that it's light outside and it's the next day is that I actually completely ran out of propane. If it was all up to me, I would have stayed up till around 11 p.m. completely forging the blade, but it wasn't this time, so... The heat of me squishing down the front of the bar actually got corrupted, so the first thing that you'll see me do is actually angle grind off some of the side ridges of the billet. Squishing the billet this much accentuated the twist ridges so much, and I wanted these completely out of the piece, or else they would sort of end up in the final blade. The very first thing that I do when I forge my chef's knives is I want to isolate exactly the amount of material that I want to use for the blade. You're going to see here that I actually mess up and give myself too little material, so I go back to the press and give myself around half an inch more material. I started filming this video directly after the premiere of the cleaver video. So I think part of my brain actually went on hiatus and forgot how to forge. One of the key aspects in a good integral chef's knife, well, at least in my opinion, is that I want that heel to be very wide. I want it to be at least two and a quarter inches wide. To help get started on giving that heel some extra width, I put on the combo flat thighs and I do an aggressive draw directly on that heel. It's actually very important here that I don't press too hard because I can actually shear the billet in half with how aggressive these eyes are. Oh yeah, there we go. Somehow I need to cut it off while not wasting three hours of my time. Why is this so difficult? Work hard and god damn it. Oh my. I'm amazed. I'm amazed. There we go. Oh, wow. You know, I think that effort deserves at least a tenth of a like. So pull out a random number generator, and if it lands on a seven, like the video. Back to the task at hand though. After I got all of that excess material cut off, it was time to isolate the material that I wanted to use for my tang. This die combination right here sort of fixes two problems. It helps me thin down my bolster right next to the heel of the blade, and it also helps straighten my spine. With the tang pretty much 100% forged to shape, it was time to start playing the long game of beveling, drawing out the heel, and playing with the profile until I fill out that mold in my mind. The profile of the blade that I have in my mind is something in between a really long santoku and something called a K-tip gyudo. 
you're probably looking at those tongs and wondering why they're smoking so much. And it's actually because I use these to quench my blades a lot. And a lot of times I don't get the oil out of the tongs before I forge with them again. To deal with this, I just threw the tongs in the forge, burn off all the oil, and then quench it in water. From this angle, you can actually start to see the firestorm pattern in the blade. It's a little harder to see from this angle, but when it's on its side and it's at a lower heat, you can start seeing those really nice twists. Where's my wit? What's going on? I like to think that my metal moving skills with a hand hammer are above average for a bladesmith, but for this build specifically, I was probably in like the 20th percentile. I don't really know what was going on. I was just having a lot of trouble getting with where I wanted it. And as a result, forging the blade took a little bit longer than I would have liked. When the blade was mostly forged to shape, I pushed the kiln over and I started preheating it very early. I wanted to go directly from the forge into the kiln and start normalizing. Oops. Oops. Uh, da, 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 da. One of the most important aspects of Firestorm Damascus is that you want to leave it fairly thick out of the forge and grind it thin later so that you get a more interesting pattern. Once I reached my minimum length of around 8.5 inches, it was on to just straightening the blade, getting everything to look exactly like the profile I had in my head, and then, honestly, it was done. Now we wait. Skokin. I did three cycles of normalization for this blade, the first of which was at 1650 degrees Fahrenheit, the second was at 1500 degrees Fahrenheit, and the last one was at 1350 degrees Fahrenheit. With the blade normalized, it was time to give it some really rough grinds. One of the most important things about these rough grinds is getting out any possible cold shut that could tear the blade apart during the quench. This is also the perfect time to start playing with the final profile of the blade. I forged the profile like 95% there. You can only get so close with the hand hammer. The grinder gives me 100% control over the exact profile. What I'm doing here is I'm just simply rounding out the corners on the edge and the spine. This will make it so that they can't possibly become stress concentrations for when I go for the quench. There's a few steps that I always do after every quench. The first of which is I check to see if it's straight and see if it requires straightening later on. And the second of which is checking it with a file to see if it actually got hard. After doing both of these things, I chuck it into a small toaster oven and I do something called a flash temper. I would do the flash temper in the kiln, but the kiln actually takes two hours for it to cool down from the quench temperature. Oh yeah, look at those temper colors. That golden color means, uh means good things. I tempered the blade at 350 degrees Fahrenheit for two hours, two times. This means that the blade is sitting at around 62 to 63 Rockwell. One of the ballpark methods for determining whether your blade is hard or not is seeing whether those sparks that come off the grinder explode into mini fireworks. <laughs> right now it's as heavy as the cleaver. It's actually gotten to the point on my channel where I have enough videos to where the voiceovers that I do on newer videos could technically be repeats of the voiceovers that I do in my earlier videos. Obviously that's a problem. So if you have something that you want me to talk about in my later videos, let me know down in the comments below. That's how high it is on that end. How high is it on this end? Oh, it's a lot lower. So we'll make it the other side to the height of this. 
What I'm doing here isn't 100% accurate because I don't really have calibrated blocks yet. But what I'm doing here is sort of just getting a general ballpark for getting my bolster symmetrical. I don't need it to be within like a thousandth of an inch. I just need it to be accurate enough so that I can start referencing other surfaces off of the bolster. If you look really closely at the size of the bolster, you'll see that there's actually a lot of deep divots from the twist earlier. And usually this would matter because I'd be doing a faceted handle, but I'm actually doing a full round handle this time, so they won't come into play. I've wanted to do a belt throw like that since I started knife making, and now is the perfect time because that belt was hot garbage. When I use belts, I sort of like to think of them having a durability of some sort. When I use my fresh belts, they start at durability 100, and they start cutting slower and slower as the durability drops. Once it gets to around 30-40%, I put them into my reserve belt category and I use them for more aggressive grinding tasks where I don't really have to worry about my belt staying sharp. One of the things that you'll notice when you see me grinding the profiles on my knives is that I actually never use a small wheel attachment. I found that the side of the platen gives me more than enough control to control the profile however I like it. This is about the point in the grinding process where I started losing my mind a little bit. Once I was about 75% done removing material from the blade, I swapped the 36 grip belt for a 50 grip belt. The 50 grip belt gives me a lot more control and it's so much smoother when it comes to the actual grinding. All right, I need to envision how much bolster I really want for this. Generally for my integral bolster knives, I leave the bolster pretty long, but because this handle is gonna be entirely rounded, I wanted to leave it a little bit shorter. Look how water damaged my hands are. If I had a mill right now, this step would be around 20 times faster and about 10 times less painful. But because I don't have a mill, I have to carefully use the sides of the platen to try and carve out that 90 degree angle as best I can. I actually have to use a bunch of different grits here because different grits of belt have different radiuses on the sides of the belt. A 36 grit belt is good for hogging off a lot of material, but when you want to get into tight corners like this, you want to use something at least at a 120 grit. When the bolster tang transition was pretty much finalized, it was time to go back to the flats of the blade and get it to its final thickness. If you look really closely, there's a few dark spots where I had to forge the blade really thin. These dark spots would matter a lot more if I were to leave the blade with a satin finish, but because this blade is forged from Damascus and I'm going to be etching it in ferric and then coffee, it really won't matter at all. Imagine if I had a carbon fiber spacer clad in brass. That'd be sick. Oh! Brass, carbon fiber brass, ebony. But now the question is, brass or bronze? Brass is brighter, but bronze is... I've used a lot of bronze, I'll do brass. What was I gonna do? One of the most costly things for me to learn was that you don't cut carbon fiber with a bandsaw. I tried cutting it with my wood bandsaw earlier and I completely destroyed the blade. I couldn't even cut a plain 2x4 afterwards. The brass pieces that I'm going to be using are actually leftover from the katana build. These were originally supposed to be used for the Fushi and Kashra, but if you read my long comment on that video, you'll actually know that I ran out of time and I didn't want to make a lackluster Fushi and Kashra. If you've ever watched Forge and Fire, you'll know that every smith on the show has used a portaband at some point, whether on the show or at home. 
I've only ever used it on the show, but I really need to get one for my home shop. I don't want to have to keep converting my metal cutting bandsaw into a standing bandsaw. One of the annoying things with working with brass this thin is that if you cut it wrong and it bends, you're going to have to deal with that bend for the entire process of working with it. I didn't show it on camera, but I actually recut these pieces with an angle grinder because my bandsaw was cutting way too slow and it was bending the pieces as they were popping off. To get a rough ballpark on how much ebony I needed to cut, I drew a really rough sketch and then I measured it out. Four inches. I wish I knew the exact species of ebony that I was using, but when I picked it up from the wood supplier, I kind of forgot to remember what they told me. If you're a woodworker and you think you know what species of ebony this is, let me know down in the comments. I know I'm not giving you a lot to work off of, but that's what makes it even more fun. To get ready to drill the holes in all of the spacers and the handle block itself, I need to first figure out the dimensions of the tang. At some point, I think I need to standardize the dimensions of my tang so that I can drill the exact same slot every single time. But that point isn't today, so I'm going to keep using the inferior method. After careful consideration, I'm not using carbon fiber and I'm not using the second spacer. I think it's too much. It is far too much going on. I think the carbon fiber clad in brass was a good idea in theory. But after looking at the pieces next to each other, I concluded that it was way too noisy. There was just far too much going on in the handle. If you've ever seen that Dude Perfect video where they do the pendulum paintings where they like drip paint everywhere and Tyler puts way too much paint on his and he absolutely destroys it, I didn't want that to be me. I'm sorry, Tyler. There's actually a second reason that I didn't want to use the carbon fiber in the handle. And that's that carbon fiber is really hazardous to work with. When you grind it, you have to basically wear a full body suit. If it gets on your skin, it can irritate it, and if it gets in your lungs, it stays in your lungs. If you didn't know this about me, I actually have asthma. And because I have asthma, I have to be a little bit more careful than the average person about stuff that can get stuck in my lungs. That's another reason that I want to get good dust collection set up in my future shop. This chart doesn't have anything between six, 1 16th and 1 4th. So what I'm assuming is that I can drill it at whatever speed I want and I'll be fine. I definitely said that with 100% non-sarcastic intent. You guys know how Will Stelter is the vice dude? I am the anti-vice dude. I've had this vice since I started blacksmithing, and I actually use it as my first anvil. I thought I didn't need an anvil when I started, so my dad and I went to Home Depot and we bought something that looked anvil-esque. Since then, I've gotten epoxy stuck on the slide, I've gotten weld bead stuck to the face, and I think I have about a centimeter's worth of backlash on the spindle. Honestly, that's close enough to where it's close enough to where I think the grind on the tang is the problem and not the whatever this thing is called. At this point, I don't really have a step-by-step -step process that I always follow. I sort of jump between four or five tools, those being the belt grinder, a file guide, a file, this wooden dowel that I used to hammer the spacer on to maybe help see some indentations, and a piece of sandpaper on the granite block. Oh! I think that is a perfect fit. With the spacer perfectly fit up to the back of the bolster, it was time to get back to the ebony handle block. I used the same trick that I did on all the previous pieces with hidden tangs, and I used some sideward pressure on the drill bit to help combine those three holes into one big slot. This is the step that I wish looked a little bit more elegant and a little bit more precise, but I haven't found or seen any method better than this without a mill. One of the things on Forge and Fire that they say is bad is burning through the slots on hidden tangs. I don't necessarily agree with this, but I see where they're coming from. A lot of people try to burn slots through when the slot isn't even close to being the shape of the tang. I only do the burn in when I have the slot like 99% carved. I'm not burning the slot through, I'm perfectly fitting it to the tang. 
Once the handle block was fit perfectly to the Tang, it was time to start getting the pieces actually ready for glue up. And the only thing that I do for that is I go back to the granite block and I sand everything perfectly flat. Actually on there pretty tight. Oh yeah. You're probably wondering, Jesse, why are you notching the tang as if you're gonna glue it up before you do any hand sanding? And that's actually because I am gluing it up before any hand sanding. How do I open this? The thing about the rounded handle geometry that I'm trying to go for is that the front of the bolster actually has to transition into the blade perfectly, but I won't know what that geometry is gonna be like until I actually shape the handle. I actually had to make a modification to my hand sanding table, aka my 2x4, because I actually didn't have a slot for that handle to fit in. I mentioned in an early video that whenever I went to go mix epoxy, I would have to do a full pump of both, meaning that I would have a lot of excess left over. Someone commented that there were lines that I could pump, like, like half a pump for one and half a pump for the other, but I, for the life of me, can't find those lines. So either the person commenting lied to me, or I'm blind. When I pour the epoxy into the handle block itself, I have to make sure that I pour it on the side of the hole and not the center, just so that there's very little air pockets. For this build in particular, I was going to be grinding every single surface after the glue up, so it didn't really matter that there's epoxy left on the outside, but out of habit, I just clean it anyway. All right, let's get this clamped up. I feel like there's a vast discrepancy in the quality of the tools in my shop. On one hand, I have one of the best 25 ton presses on the market. And on the other hand, I use just a jumble of three clamps for all of my glue ups. A better clamp system would be good to have, but it wouldn't really change the quality of the glue up. All right. I feel like on my channel, I've only shown me doing like faceted chef's knife handles. I've never done like a fully round handle. I feel like it's a little bit too early in my career to say that I have a distinct style, but if I were to give a bullet point list of things that define the knives that I made in the past, the bullets would definitely include just a faceted handle. I feel like it's even more important to mark a center line on rounded handles than faceted handles, because on rounded handles, once you start breaking those corners, it's hard to find a plane that you can treat as your point of reference. Just like how I don't use small wheel attachments to grind the profile of the blade itself, I also don't use them to shape the handle at all. I feel like when I started knife making, I didn't have the most tools when it came to the grinder, so my grinding style sort of adapted to that lack of tools. And now that I actually have small wheel attachments, it's actually hard for me to start using them because it's just it just feels unnecessary. This is the step in the handle grinding process where I finally get rid of all those dark marks in the bolster. Usually when I'm shaping my handles, there's really no hard stop point, but for this blade in particular, there is a minimum stop point. Those dark marks have to be pretty much 100% out of the handle. I think there's one big change I need to make this handle. If the handle is entirely rounded, this facet doesn't make sense. So I think I'm going to try to smoothly connect the blade to the handle so that there's no line right here. If there's any one knife maker that has impacted my handle style the most, or like my blade style in general the most, it's probably Mareko Mamasi. I've never studied under him and I've only met him once, but I've scrolled his Instagram for hours on end, just marveling at how well his handles flow and how intentional every single facet looks. The belt that I'm using here is something called a scalloped belt. The sides of the belt are ground in sort of a wave pattern, which means I can grind the inside of corners without worrying about the side of the belt digging into those corners. A lot of people like to use 220 grit or 400 grit J-Flex belts for this, but in my opinion, the scalloped belts are just so much better at the exact same job.
At this point, my edge was already at three to five thousandths of an inch thick, but I wanted to try doing something that I've actually never done on a chef's knife, and that's zero grinding it before hand sanding. This is technically a bit of a double-edged sword, because if I go to hand sand the knife and then I cut myself, it'll be a lot deeper than if I didn't do this, but the edge geometry is just going to be that much better. You know what? This file never gets used as a file. It's only ever used as my hand sanding stick. So I'm just going to... I'm going to grind off the file. I guarantee you that if a machine shop found out I did this, they would put me on a hit list. The thing about hand sanding this blade is that it's a lot smaller than the cleaver I just hand sanded a week ago. So I was actually kind of looking forward to hand sanding and actually seeing progress happen before my eyes. This is the part of the blade that took the longest to hand sand, which is the bolster blade transition. I didn't get it fully cleaned up on the grinder, so I had to do some geometry setting with sandpaper. The stuff that you saw me spray is called fluid film. The fluid film acts as a protective coating so that when I flip the blade and leave it face down on the wood itself, it doesn't flash rust. One important thing that I've learned about hand sanding blades with integral bolsters and wooden handles is that you can't really sand that transition directly. The wood disappears a lot faster than the metal, so if you sand that transition, you'll get a sort of depth differential. I almost forgot to mention what videos I watched while I was hand sanding the blade. This time, I think I rewatched the entire series of Alec moving into his new shop in Montana, and I've seen the entire series four to five times already, but it's just so satisfying to see someone set up a brand new shop with all those spanking new tools. My hand sanding strategy was a little bit weird for this blade. Rather than hand sanding the entire blade to 600 grit and then doing the handle, I sort of flip flop between the blade and the handle, alternating until I got both to 600 grit. To help keep the theme of the rounded handle, I actually also completely rounded the spine. Usually I just break the corners, but I felt like it would flow a little bit better if the roundness of the handle continued all the way through the spine. To help prepare the maker's mark for darkening with some gun blue, I actually clean out the inside of the etched area with a 5000 grit sanding pad. In theory, this helps clean the steel a little bit better than if I just use acetone. Oops. With my maker's mark now etched and darkened, it was time to start thinking about etching the actual blade itself. That should be enough. I'm just using the wire here as a method of dipping the blade in and out of the ferric because my tank is like four feet tall. The thing that I use to clean my blade before I etch is actually just regular dish soap. I've tried to use degreasers and acetone, but they always leave like little splotches. Dish soap has left a pristine finish every single time that I've ever used it. This won't fall in, right? Alright, I have no idea how this is going to look. Let's see. Whoa! <laughs> Wait, that's actually a firestorm. This is literally like a maelstrom. Like, I don't even know what that word means, but... <sighs> look at those spirals. Holy shite. Obviously, from my reaction, I didn't really expect to see this pattern at all. Usually when I'm grinding, I can sort of see glimpses of what the pattern is going to look like when it's etched, but for this piece in particular, I couldn't see anything at all. What is this? 
If you look at the pattern pretty closely, you can sort of deconstruct what the bar looked like before you twisted it. In this case, it was crushed Ws. So if you look at the edge and if you look at the spine, you'll see a bunch of mini explosions. After cleaning everything up with 2500 grit sandpaper and cleaning the transitions up with a 5000 grit sanding pad, it was time to go in for etch cycle number two. In terms of what's different between the first and second etching cycle, the only difference is that the second one comes after the first one. One of the side effects of etching with ferric is that it actually etches depth into the material. And sometimes if the edge is too thin, you can actually etch like these little serrations into your edge. And that's not something I wanted. I was using the edge of my fingernail and running it along the edge of the blade to make sure that the edge was still flat. And luckily it was. Perfect. Too much. With the coffee solution ready and now with the blade clean, it was time to let the blade coffee etch for three full hours. Alright, three hours later. Oh yeah. Yo, look at that contrast. Now that is a firestorm. This thin oil coating should let that coffee etch set permanently. If I were to use sunshine cloth on the blade immediately after the coffee etch, it would actually wipe some of it off. So this oil is actually pretty important. But yeah, after a quick wipe with the sunshine cloth and a quick buff on the handle, the blade is actually completely finished. I hope you enjoyed watching me build this Firestorm and Damascus Chef's Knife, and I hope you enjoy the B-roll as well. After evicting Marlow from the chair that I used to sharpen, it was time to give the blade its final edge. Right now, because the edge was basically already at zero, I didn't need to start with 400 grit again, so I went straight to the 3000 grit Chosera Waterstone. One of my favorite methods for checking to see if the knife is actually getting sharp is running it along the side of my fingernail. If I drop the blade and it catches on my nail, then I know it's at least decently sharp. If there are sections of the blade that sort of glide across my fingernail with no catch, then I know exactly what places I need to target when I go back to the stone. Look at how small that micro bevel is. You can barely see it on either side. This math homework is from 2014, but it's time for it to not exist anymore. Oh. Don't forget to click the link in the description for up to 60% off an annual plan with Incogni.